so the title, uh, as Pericles said, is Connected and Automated Mobility. Um, I slightly changed the subtitle, but it's essentially the same thing. So it's a data, cooperation, and infrastructure. Uh, yes, I, I've been at Bristol University for quite some time, and uh, I've been doing uh, sort of connected uh, intelligent systems since, uh, since the beginning of, of my uh, research career. And connected automated vehicles, or connected vehicles for the, for the last 10 years. Uh, I, um, I have also second affiliation. I work um, part-time at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the U UK uh, National Institute for Data Sciences and AI. Uh, I, I thought I would start this talk with trying to put on the map uh, Bristol. Bristol, um, you know, maybe not, not all of you May, may know where Bristol actually is, other than it's somewhere in, in, in the UK. Uh, and I'm reliably told that for people to know where cities are, their cities need to have very good football teams. Uh, so Bristol sadly doesn't have a good football team. It's quite, you know, I'm originally from Poland. My football team uh, my, uh, from my original hometown is also rubbish. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's my life. Nobody really, no team, football team to support. So since we don't have football team uh, to, to, you know, to, to, to be proud of, uh, we have other things uh, to be proud of uh, in the city, and here's a bit of a list things, some of the sort of curiosities uh, that you may or may not know. Banksy, Banksy, uh, who is currently uh, regarded as a best street artist, at least most famous street artist in the world. He's actually from Bristol. Uh, I remember when I arrived in Bristol, he actually was considered a vandal. Now he's been elevated to uh, street artist, but never mind. Uh, Bristol has a very large um, uh, sector of uh, media uh, production companies. Ardaman Production uh, produces Wallace and Gromit. You know, you, you might, might have seen it. Chicken Run, it's, uh, this kind of movies. And in fact, uh, BBC Natural History uh, Division is also based in Bristol. So all the um, sort of natural history uh, films that BBC produces that normally are narrated by David Attenborough. This is this is done in Bristol. Other interesting factoids: uh, Long John Silver. You may have read uh, as a kid, Treasure Island. Uh, Long John Silver uh, uh, allegedly is from Bristol and was recruiting in a pub that still exists. Yeah? They sell actually pretty good beer still in that pub. Uh, Concord uh, was designed and built in Bristol. Uh, well, in truth partially because part of it was also done in France, in Toulouse. Uh, Darth Vader, so if you're Star Wars, then you might rejoice in, in the, your newfound knowledge that Darth Vader was a Bristolian, or, or more aptly actually, you know, the guy who played Darth Vader that you cannot see other than, than this black mask. An interesting thing which I actually found this morning is that the bungee jump was invented in Bristol. So here we have a Clifton Suspension Bridge, very uh, well known a landmark, perhaps most popular or most well-known landmark in, in, um, of Bristol. There's about 100 meters uh, from uh, the, the bridge to, to Avon River. It was in the 80s. Uh, it was used as a bungee jump venue. It's been banned uh, for a number of years on health and safety grounds, as you would imagine. Uh, just I've literally just run through uh, some of the technical bits that we do in Bristol. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, you know, we have websites. So if anybody wants to uh, check a bit more, uh, please, please do so. So just a tiny little plug. As I'm myself affiliated with communication systems and networks, uh, which is part of Smart Internet Lab, large organizations, you know, loads of people, uh, long track record caught reading lots of great stuff, as, as, as you would imagine, I would say. Lots of projects, um, so kind of uh, 5G projects, um, lots of kind of European funded, but also UK funded projects. Again, I'm not going to list, there's uh, tons of this um, uh, activities going on uh, across uh, our research labs. In fact, that list, I think, is already outdated. Right, but uh, what I want to talk today uh, can be kind of abbreviated uh, using this new, and I think really uh, cool uh, term, ACES. So ACES stands for Automated, Connected, Electric, and Shared. And specifically, you know, we don't have much time, so I will concentrate on uh, the confluence of automation connectivity. There, there's a good reason why you want to consider them jointly and they are intim uh, intimately uh, intertwined. So in essence, I'm going to talk about the medley of AI, CAV, and networks. Um, so AI, um, I'm sure many of you already know it very well. So again, I'm not going to uh, uh, produce any introduction. 
uh, but essentially, you know, people use it interchangeably now with machine learning. So machine learning, there, there's this there's, uh, um, traditionally um, kind of subgroups uh, within machine learning that supervise and supervise on the reinforcement learning. And I will touch uh, on these uh, aspects in, in today's seminar. And just to put nice pictures, automation um, here, this is a pretty cool example of or automation. It's a Waymos uh, vehicle. You may recognize this is a um, Jag, um, so I-Pace electric vehicle, uh, with which is automated by by Waymo, uh, which is a, a, um, a division of, of Google. And networks. Uh, well, well, we know that we know what, what networks are. Okay. So I would like to just. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of that stuff is fairly known, but I just want to uh, say why we think uh, automation is good. So what specifically are the benefits? Perhaps maybe think if there are areas where the, 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 the benefits could be questionable. Uh, so we, the, the, the headline kind of feature of automation and the main reason why people do this is road safety. We, we know that about 95% of all accidents are due to a human error, the driver's error, essentially. Um, so now we, we could eliminate that. So the road safety should, should definitely improve. Journey reliability. Um, so that's very important. Um, um, a lot of uh, policy makers, for example, in the UK, Department for Transport actually is very interested in, in, in trying to improve reliability or journey time to reliability. So essentially remove the randomness, the noise from the system, because if you have various as aspects or modalities um, of in your transportation network um, more predictable, then you can introduce all sorts of uh, fancy stuff like mo mobility as a service. Congestion, uh, yes. You know, if the system is automated and well connected and orchestrated, yes, you should be able to, to, to improve uh, all of that. Uh, this is actually an area where we'll see automation being rolled out first, uh, I believe. So freight, cost, and optimizations. So essentially, we, we're talking about um, goods, uh, transportation of goods. So auto Automation of uh, lorries, trucks, um, maybe parcel delivery services. In fact, this is already happening. Um, so definitely, there's going to be huge benefit and huge, uh, huge impact. This is um, a less uh, often um, issue that is being talked about. Uh, so that's so uh, social inclusion, equity, I extremely important. Uh, the hope is that um, you know having a, um, automated transportation, we should be able to offer additional mobility options um, those disadvantaged. So the elderly U UK has nearly 10 million retired people, about 5 million are living alone in social isolation. Um, so the additional mobility option would have a great uh, positive impact on, on quality of life. Now, a few kind of interesting uh, issues to consider. Traffic volume, um, I put it, I, until recently, I had maybe, um, uh, meaning that we don't really know, but traffic volume might actually de 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 decrease. So this is a kind of several uh, factors in place that on one side may increase the traffic volumes. So if the uptake is great, it might, might increase. And if the cars are rolled up as a part of mobility as a service, meaning that they will, uh, as taxis, we will uh, connect um, uh, different people. So on occasions they will drive empty. That may increase actually traffic volumes. So we, we shall see what, what's going to happen. Pollution is a proxy for traffic volume. You know, so traffic volume goes up, pollution goes up, traffic volume goes down, pollution goes down, and obviously electrification will offset the pollution elsewhere. So and, and then we have renewables that may not be an issue either. And that's an interesting uh, item that again is very rarely being discussed. Its impact on cycling, walking, and other means of, of active um, commute. People are genetically uh, lazy, so you know there's no denying that. You know, it's it's if you are you know, if 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 you are offered very cheap or free method of transportation uh, and it's convenient, uh, would you instead be cycling? Who knows? I mean, um, it, we can predict there will be um, a large proportion of people that may may elect to actually. It, take the, the, the lazy option. So uh, we, we shall see what's gonna happen. And I, I, I felt it, it's also useful to quickly just um, table um, auto, autonomy definition. So if you're coming or if you've ever uh, read the, this literature, you, you would have, you, you would know that there are six levels of autonomy being defined by uh, this uh, reg, SAE, that particular number, 
um, define the levels of automation. These are very well um, adopted now. So, you know, many people, even in popular press, will, will tell you this is level three autonomy or level four, level five. So very briefly, what this means is level zero means um, automation, com complete uh, manually driven and progressively, we, we can see higher and higher uh, automation. So as a reference point, Tesla Autopilot latest version is about the level three. So that, that's the kind of currently available, uh, commercially available technology out there. As you can see, we have still some time or a few uh, updates, um, uh, well, some, some work to be done to introduce commercially level four and level five. Um, uh, automation. So very briefly, what that means, what, what's the difference? Level four is, is sometimes uh, referred to as conditional uh, automation, meaning that the car actually should uh, start and complete the journey without ceding control. So we'll not do the, the kind of silly thing as, as Tesla may do. That will say, I don't know what to do, please grab, uh, uh, grab the, the, the wheel. But this is restricted. And then the restriction typically would be weather condition, particular road type, traffic. So the, 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 it's, it's bounded it's limited or, or, um, uh, or automation an ultimate level is when there is no completely no limits so essentially the way to think of this or the way i define it is you know if, if, if you uh, put two pins on on a map yeah so in greece for example um, and as long as human can drive from a to b machine can do it as as well regardless of of particular traffic condition weather and uh, and, and, and anything else. Uh, again, the, 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 the kind of a little uh, tour of what's going on around the world. Uh, as I'm sure you know, there is, the world has gone crazy uh, about o o automated vehicles. So there is a plenty of actors, companies that, that develop the, the technology and hope to commercialize it and, and make some money later on. And according to the last count, there is nearly 100 kind of semi-serious or serious or very serious or, or, uh, organizations around the world doing this. So it's a heavily placed. And some of the uh, names here, I'm sure you know, so way more still considered as, as a leader. Um, and, and then we have all the big auto manufacturers, uh, but also uh, some, some other companies. The interesting headline figure is that the, the annual spent uh, on R&D is 50 billion. This is uh, the kind of back of the envelope uh, calculation. In many cases, actually also um, includes uh, electrification R&D activities. Okay, so it's, it's not just uh, automation, but it's eye-watering figure. Uh, in addition to big boys, we have a number of uh, smaller, I mean, when I say smaller, actually many of these guys are hundreds of millions um, market cap. Okay, so this is, this is not really a small company. And these are big, big boys. Right, why do you need that kind of big budget? And, and I felt it would be nice to try to uh, think and, 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 and show you what you can do. When, you know, if you were to start your, your, you know, your, your startup, uh, trying to do uh, connected automated mobility, uh, what kind of money you need to have and what you could potentially achieve. So this is um, literally by, by observing what the other, uh, others have done. Okay, and, uh, and I um, put it into kind of free or free leagues. So the, the starter, li literally the, the kind of initial fooling around with automated mobility, this day, actually, you can, you can automate the car reasonably cheaply. Okay, so all you have to do, uh, all you have to have really is, you know, a thousand, spare thousand dollars, maybe a little bit more. You go to this company called comma.ai, you buy a suite of sensors, which is principally just a dash cam and a few other bits and pieces. Uh, it comes with a, a automation stack, so basically up. Uh, one thing I should say, she has obviously a car as well, with, which needs to be uh, compatible with the system, needs to be uh, drive by wire. So you connect to, to your car uh, controls and you can do you know, simple things. You, you can drive uh, or, you know, in, in, in the car park. Uh, maybe doing sorts of you know simple things between the traffic cones. Uh, one leak up. This is where you know if you want to do, have a startup, that kind of money you need to have this day. So tens of millions uh, essentially. And the reason why you have is maybe put it that way. Let, let me just go slightly uh, back uh, again. What that kind of money will buy you in terms of um, practical impact and implications. Um, um, and the, the, the metric I picked is effectively a safety. OK, 
Okay, this is very important. And uh, uh, safety, I'm gonna measure it in terms of um, miles that you hope to cover without a catastrophic incident. Okay, so here you've got the money you have and here how many miles you hope you, your vehicle will drive with the, without doing something completely stupid that will result in a loss of life or serious injury. That, that's the way to think of this. Okay, so this thousand dollars will drive a car in a car park, but if you take it on a road, within the first mile, it will do something catastrophic. Okay, so not good. You need to have more money. That's why these companies spend that much uh, money. Okay, so the next leak is tens of millions. So that's how, you know, Google's have started and now the company is tens of millions. And even with that, in essence, you can cover just a few miles before you do something stupid, okay? So perhaps, again, this is just, a, you know, a back of the envelope, 10 miles you can cover before something happens. Is it bad or is it good? By comparison, the current road safety figures are that we observe around one fatality per 100 person miles, okay? So for every 100 million miles uh, covered, there's one person being killed on the roads. You know, if you look at 10 with respect to 100 million, that's not good, obviously. This is not good. Okay, and that's why you need to be spending loads of money. How much safer you might hope to achieve the, the well, this is again hotly debated. Automated vehicles will need to be safer. By how much? Well, I would submit to you that probably 100 times it's a kind of good um, uh, a figure uh, to aim for. Okay, so 10 billion miles without a fatal uh, accident uh, on average. And coincidentally, to achieve that, you need to have about $10 billion in R&D budget. That, that's about the, the kind of top leak. You know, people like way more uh, are, are spending. So yes, so it, it's literally, you know, so driving, simple driving is not a big deal. Driving for very long and not causing havoc, it's a big deal, essentially. Right, I'd like to now show you a little bit, uh, this is slightly outdated uh, figure, uh, so I'm, I'm not gonna dwell too much on this, uh, but what I have here is, is a list of uh, how many miles we covered in California only. So th this is uh, um, pulled out uh, California uh, Motor Vehicle Department, Department for Motor Vehicles. In fact, California is, is scaring um, a lot of these companies because they, they mandate making this uh, public and companies don't really like sharing this in the public domain. So this is one of the main reasons why lots of these companies actually now live in California and testing in, in places like, like Arizona and, and um, you know, Pennsylvania and many other, other um, uh, kind of states uh, in the US. Yeah, so in California, at least you, you can kind of look at this and see this engagement is basically a, a mild um, incident, you can think of this. And this is the rate of disengagement uh, per covered mile. Interestingly, uh, Waymo ha has recently hit the landmark. They, they've covered 10 million miles on the roads and they do lots of um, simulation work. So they've built a huge digital twin of, uh, and, 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 and they are testing in, in sims and they've done over 10 billion miles. Right, okay, but today I'd like to be uh, talking about uh, cooperation infrastructure, why, why we need that. And I think to convey this idea, why this is important, why we need that, I have this, this, this figure and I have two opposite ends of, of a kind of control. You can think of it as, as a kind of control. So at the one end, we have um, current crop of automated vehicles and I call them free agents, meaning that the decision is fully uh, taken, uh, computed um, by, by the vehicle itself. So you can think of it as a sort of, you know, it, this thing has a free will to, to a certain extent. The other end of the spectrum is remote control. Um, so that, that should convey the idea quite well. And we believe that the future is somewhere in between. Okay, so um, there, there, there are benefits to be reaped, some ability to influence how your vehicle drives. And this, this, um, this ability is exerted by external entities. And this is a kind of neat picture that kind of shows, uh, or at least conveys the idea why you want to do this. You know, you want to have a system that operates as optimally and produces uh, the best possible result. Another analogy I use is the, the, the kind of um, control that is currently used uh, in air uh, transportation, air traffic control. So what I'm saying here that you don't want externally to control the steering wheel of the vehicle. That, uh, that's 
I know this, this, there are these kind of ideas being, being um, actively researched, uh, but, but, but there are, they are problems with that. But what you want to do instead is perhaps incentivize the vehicle or disincentivize to, to drive in a particular manner or maybe allocate an equivalent to an air corridor. Okay, so you won't, you, you, you won't have some kind of rough or high level control of the vehicle. Control vehicle, uh, essentially that means sending commands, allowing vehicles uh, to, to exchange information, and, and that's where you need infrastructure, okay? So vehicles, when they talk to each other or take the infrastructure, actually what you need is the entire network, cyber physical structure that sits underneath and allows that to happen. Okay, so the way to think of this, you know, you've got the roads as you would have, but you have the entire kind of nervous system of, of connectivity, lots of sensors and actuators, uh, in addition to your usual traffic lights and everything else. You can hope to achieve, you know, better safety, efficiency, reliability, and, uh, and, um, and predictability. Um, one th term I'm going to use as well, and I should probably unpack, is V2X. Again, uh, people from, from this field will recognize it easily. So V2X X is, a, is a placeholder and, and replaces vehicle infrastructure, pedestrian or network. Okay, so vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure and so on. It's the mode of, of connectivity. I've got one quick slide I think is interesting. It's the kind of historical overview of infrastructures um, for road transportation. So the history starts with uh, the first uh, mass produced vehicle and that's Ford Model T. It rolled out of production lines in 1908, soon after roads were being built, tarmac roads um, uh, after, and uh, the number of, of, of these vehicles increased to the point that um, havoc ensued on our roads and there was a need, clear need, to, um, to mandate some sort of rules, behavior essentially, okay? And UK was the first country in the world to introduce the Road Traffic Act. And the le legislation dates back to 1930. Uh, so essentially, we're talking about mandated use of signals, um, road signage, road surface signage, uh, and so on, okay? So basically, how to behave on the road, what to do, what you cannot do. So here today, I'm gonna talk about, and I'm trying to uh, project into the future, how this all will look um, sort of 10 years from now, okay? So 2030 and, and beyond. And I've already alluded that, you know, you, we're going to have a mixture, essentially. Lots of digital stuff, lots of digital networks. We'll have um, a kind of units that will be close to the roadside. These are the referred to as the roadside units. There, there will be connectivity on, on cars. These are referred to as onboard units. Uh, we're going to have um, various additional compute uh, machines. These are called fog orchestrations. Um, additional sensing. There, there's a very good case why you want to be doing this. And all the kind of good stuff. I'm going to pick on one particular particular part of this infrastructure that's the fog. Again, fog, some people differentiate it from a mobile edge compute. Um, I'm not going to make that differentiation. The, you know, that's perhaps not important for this lecture. Uh, what that means, you've got um, vast or substantial, at least uh, computational resources, which are next uh, to the car. So by, by the roadside or in the near vicinity. Again, though, well, I guess most of us will, will know why you want to be doing this. The reduced latency is one aspect of it. Uh, data privacy, I didn't put in here. Uh, it's also a good reason why you want to be doing this. All of that put together, you may have a whole host of additional benefits. Here's a quick list. So you may have um, additional safety critical services. You know, you, you can achieve this um, traffic orchestration. You can have um, additional um, sort of um, services that will enhance your uh, security and and and. and and safety. And I, I want to just uh, put a placeholder and just uh, mention some of these um, kind of future services that the research community is currently talking about, and in some cases, in fact, already thinking about standardization. So cooperative uh, awareness and sensing, um, the, the kind of uh, primitive version of that is already uh, standardized. Um, so the, the basic version is that each vehicle, so the, uh, what each of these guys essentially sends, you can think of it as a heartbeat information. So just, this is a short message, that's who I am, and the, these are my, my trip current trip parameters. So that's my location, basically time and location stamp and maybe acceleration, deceleration parameters. Could add um, a little bit of sensing, okay? So you can, these vehicles can potentially exchange some local 
sensory readings suitably encoded and represented. Okay? It, it, it's a big issue still uh, to be done, and I will touch on, on it uh, later on. Uh, the next um, item on, on, on the agenda is once you have wireless connectivity digital system in, in, in place, you can do lots of kind of uh, fancy stuff uh, in, in, ver in, in the digital virtual domain. So, you know, there are these ideas where you can have uh, replaced completely uh, traffic lights. Okay, so, you know, this is the traffic light, uh, as, as we know everywhere. In principle, you don't need to have it. Uh, you can just send the, you know, the information uh, to the vehicle directly. And even you can have it retrospectively uh, um, uh, rolled out to human-driven vehicles by having some kind of dash dashboard version of this. So yes, you can do that. Uh, there is a huge cost benefit. So one thing I've learned recently is that in UK, we, we use um, uh, what's called smart motorways. Um, uh, effectively, it's a, it's a kind of traffic light on the motorway that the that tells you what the speed you should be doing. Every single that that, that kind of um, uh, gangway, it costs cool four million quid to build, and then there's a substantial upkeep cost. Yeah, so there, there's a huge, huge um, cost benefit uh, to be had if you put everything in virtual domain. Plus, you can change it dynamically, everything. And then you can uh, also have dynamic uh, traffic flow control. Um, okay, so you can literally have uh, some kind of uh, better version of a SAPNAV where where you add it, enhance it, and coordinate between vehicles. Um, and and the security, security, whole host of issues. I will touch on some of them uh, today, but there is uh, there is no by no means uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, give you an exhaustive list. After many many projects, we, we have uh, put together some a little um, um, kind of set of KPIs that you need for each of these services. Um, again, I think there's no time to go into details, and many of you may have the issues. Um, again, this is meant to be uh, just, just a quick um, kind of ballpark figure um, that, that, that is uh, useful um, to, to have an informed discussion. One kind of topic that comes immediately uh, and needs to be considered when we're talking about connected automated vehicles is just the scale of the thing, and specifically the, the, the challenge in terms of zipping around the data. So uh, vehicles um, um, Uber sensed, so you know they have all sorts of different sensors. You know, uh, several cameras. It would have typically uh, several lidars, so there would be a typically big lidar on, on on the top and four corner lidars as well. Unless you're Tesla, then you don't have lidars, but that's a separate issue. Plus radars and ultrasonic sensors, everything else. Over one hour, this will produce around four TB, four terabyte of, 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 of data, huge amounts, especially when you compare it to kind of state of the art um, airliner. Airliner, big airliner, um, modern airliner, A350 has 6,000 sensors. It produces only, <laughs> only, uh, it's funny to say only, 2.5 TB per day, okay? This is four TB per hour. This is 2.4 uh, TB per day, huge difference. If you scale it up, so Bristol is much smaller than Thessaloniki, and Thessaloniki would be even bigger. So assuming um, kind of 12 hour per each vehicle, 3,000 vehicles, that's about 150 petabytes per day. It's huge, absolutely huge um, uh, data. Um, obviously, the, 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 you know, the question is, do you really need to offload all of that data? Is there a need? So this is the you know, kind of separate issues that we, we may have. The in fact, community is having continuously these this, this discussions. Complexity of these vehicles, hugely complicated machines, as you would imagine, you know, if um, the, the, the automation um, software stack is it's, um, very difficult um, to, to, to write, to develop, that's when you do kind of uh, humongous budgets. The typical connector automated vehicle will have a, a hundred million lines of code. By comparison, uh, to run large hydron collider in Geneva, you just need 50 million lines of code, okay? So this is just based on that. You can, th th this, you can think of that the one connected vehicle is, is, seems to be a bit more complicated machine than large hydro collider. Again, people may, may take uh, issues uh, with this. Right, um, I'm mindful of the time, so I'd like to quickly just show you some of the research that we have done recently. But before that, um, I just wanna say a little bit how uh, those vehicles work, and, and I'm, I'm going to use um, or refer to some aspects of machine learning um, because I, I will need that uh, later in the talk. 
so there's various um, um, kind of stages to developing a software stack for connected auto automated vehicle. The, the, the first one is environmental perception. So you know, if, if you're a vehicle here, um, or any driver, you need to know where you are. You need to know all the uh, other road users and, and label them and, and build some sort of uh, bounding boxes. Yeah, so this is what, what's called a, a grid occupancy um, uh, kind of task. This is typically done by supervised learning. Okay, so we know that these days this is nearly exclusively done using um, DNNs, um, uh, deep neural nets, or CNNs really. So you know it's it's, it's mostly e e done through image. Although um, you know if you use uh, lidar, then it's a slightly different type type of neural net. But in all cases, this will be done using uh, supervised learning. Okay, so you show lots of lots of examples, and you train your your humongous sized neural nets. The second uh, element, once you know uh, where you are on the road or the users where they are and you're given command to drive somewhere, you need to plan your trajectory. So how to weave uh, 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 between all these obstacles. So this is the trajectory planning task. There are various uh, strategies about these days. Reinforcement learning seems to be the way forward. And in fact, uh, um, when you enact some micro control, so this is lateral and longitudinal control, this is done using reinforcement learning as well. So essentially, you know, the vehicle has a two degrees of freedom. You, 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 you know, is your steering wheel left, right, or accelerate, decelerate? Okay, so that, that's essentially. So you, you, take, you take this trajectory and, and you then translate it into this kind of uh, micro actions. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on what RL is. So I'll, I'll come back to this one. And you also need some sort of oversight over what's going on in the system to make sure nothing falls over. And if it does, you need to know it. Um, so this is the, the section that, that is anomaly detection. And uh, the typical strategy is to use unsupervised learning. And I will we'll talk about this as well. In fact, I'm gonna talk about it now. This is an example. So what we do, to, to be specific, the, 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 the kind of thing we do in my lab is we're not building automated vehicle stack. As I mentioned, there are other companies doing this. We're looking at um, kind of management of fleets of vehicles and all the, the kind of challenges that arise if you want to have it. Uh, so one challenge that, that, that is there is, is you know, you, you zoom out. This is city. In fact, this is the road uh, layout of Bristol. For those who may have been in Bristol, you should be able to recognize. There's a Clifton Triangle and University is somewhere here. This is pulled out initially from OpenStreetMap, and then, then there's this, um, so this is OpenStreetMap, various software packages that then simulate on the top of that. But here, the, the, the kind of use case we, we were interested in is we, we want to have a system that oversees operation of the entire city fleet and wants to spot out um, the kind of weird things, so potential problems, anomalies, in other words. Uh, so as I mentioned, the vehicles have already uh, or at least standardized, not, not maybe implemented, but standardized uh, service um, uh, called the basic safety message. Um, this is the US actually version of the service. In, in Europe, this is CAM, that essentially each vehicle sends um, the, the kind of status information. So these, these traces here are effectively um, the, the kind of digital breadcrumbs, you can think of this. So each vehicle, each, each little um, line here, it has a certain length in color. This corresponds to uh, one vehicle uh, kind of sending this information, which contains time and location stamps. And then you can receive all these messages from all vehicles and reconstruct this kind of traces. That, that's essentially what's going on here. And in this um, um, kind of study, we wanted to, to understand or build the, the, uh, um, the landscape of um, baseline normality. Okay, so we build what, what is normal state of the traffic flow, essentially. And to do that, I use uh, um, unsupervised techniques. In this case, uh, this is a deep autoencoder network. It's a deep neural net. You put all of the kind of stuff, Bristol on this side. It looks weird because you also put it on uh, at the other side and train this network to reconstruct all these traces uh, with uh, lowest possible distortion and force it at the same time uh, to have some kind of low dimensional representation. Okay, so you, you learn essentially low dimensional representation. The kind of geeky term used for that is low, it's manifold learning or low dimensional representation. But it works uh, and it works very well. So here's just a numerical example. So here, what we've done is uh, we artificially injected uh, anomalies uh, and then tried to spot them. Okay, an anomaly here is a vehicle that maliciously uh, misreports its own location. Okay, so that's what it is. And the, the way to spot it, uh, you, you can train this autoencoder 
not uh, only with um, what uh, the timestamp is received, but also with sort of meta um, uh, features of the network. So specifically um, RSSI, so signal strength. If you take it jointly, then it's very difficult um, to kind of fool uh, this type of system. And here we have uh, three cases. This is um, progressively um, making um, more daring false uh, attempts. You can think of this. So here what we have is a vehicle that, or malicious vehicle that attempts to report a location which is up to 10 meters away from its true location. Is between 30 and 40 meters, and this is between 100 and 500 meters. Obviously, the, the, as, you do, as you would expect, the more daring um, the, um, the naughty vehicle is, the easier it is to spot it. And, and the, these, this is the typical way of representing these results. Something called a rock curve basically trades off or tells you how well your system is trying to detect. And, and this is statistical representation. This is a, a true positive rate and false positive rate. Yeah, I said I would not be talking about COVID, uh, but these curves are being uh, also used to, to show um, how good a test in a medical context are. Yeah, this is essentially binary hy hypothesis testing program. Uh, again, I'm, I'm badly running out of time, so I'm gonna be very, very quick. And no time uh, for crash course in reinforcement learning. So just very briefly, uh, RL is a problem where um, you know we have a state of the world. Uh, this could be the environment, exactly all locations, everything that it is the vehicle. But the point is that this has some kind of dynamics. So you know it it's, it kind of evolves over time. You may assume that there is Markovian structure to it. So you know. Uh, this uh, at, at state, maybe at state two, if you condition on S1, this is independent of S0. This may or may not be true. Don't tend to stress too much about this. That you just put, that, that's what it is. This is the center of um, equation, what that means. In addition here, this is where the decision uh, name comes from. You've got action, that's as the decision. So in this case, this would be driving of the vehicle. So you accelerate, decelerate, that's your action. You affect state of the world. So you've got this kind of slightly more complicated dynamics here. And uh, you, your task at hand uh, to come up with the policy, so kind of recipe, how you're gonna drive your vehicle essentially, okay? So here is the set of actions. The, the, this, this is a kind of standard solution using uh, functional representation neural nets. So say, if this is study of the world, that's what, you know, this, these are numbers of vehicles in front of me and all other kind of road users, I should be uh, doing that kind of maneuver effectively. There's many, many different ways of training this. This is just one example. Uh, in principle, you can think of it, you know, if I show to a neural network every single possible example in the world that this is the state of the world, um, for example, this could be done by observing a human driver. And then you can say that this is uh, what needs to happen. So that's how this is used for driving vehicle. But here, um, or at Bristol, as I said, we, what we tend to do is to you know, look at these examples, how those big companies, Waymo and the like, uh, are developing that for, for driving the actual vehicle. And we look what we could do using the same strategies or similar at the higher level, at the kind of uh, you know, network la layer. And one way you can use RL is applied to cybersecurity. So this is fairly new research. Uh, it's, a, it's a project we, we've just completed. Uh, it's already public domain, so we worked with IBM and Honda uh, on this. What, what, what you can do is try to think about cybersecurity. So, you know, in cybersecurity, you know, you're assuming these are that they, they can be exter external uh, malevolent agent. I put that as a kind of red, red, red guy that attempts to fiddle something, you know, inject uh, uh, some perturbation, some anomalies, or maybe even hack your system. This is represented by this action. And you hope you have, uh, well, you definitely need to have, not just hope, uh, your uh, benevolent agent, so the good guy, uh, that will try to counteract, okay? And you can set it up, essentially you can see straight away the way this is set up is effectively as, as a kind of adversarial uh, game. Okay, so this guy is trying to disrupt the system, this is trying to make it counteract, makes it fluid. So this is a very useful way of developing uh, defense policies. Okay, and you can train it. This idea, in fact, is borrowed directly from uh, what DeepMind has recently done with AlphaZero, playing all these computer games to superhuman level. So DeepMind um, produced lots of, um, I'm talking about Alpha Zero, Mu Zero, the, the, this type of algorithms. These are all trained by using self-play. Uh, so effectively some kind of zero sum self, you know, the agent is playing against each, each other all the time and coming up with better, better policies. You can do the same thing. 
So the, the good thing is this is a completely new area uh, for, for future work uh, because the traditional one in cybersecurity is you do the kind of pen testing. You know? So you try to have, a, uh, you think about what are uh, penetration, uh, what are attack vectors, and then you think how well resilient your system is. The, the, in this case, we automate fully both ends. How does it work? Just, just a um, quick um, kind of cute figure. Uh, so I want to show. So th this is a, a little um, kind of test. Uh, what we have here is uh, is, a, is, a, is a use case of traf or, or tra um, um, CAF orchestration. So this is a, effectively junction, this kind of future junction when these vehicles try to navigate themselves without traffic lights. And we have one vehicle, uh, the, the blue one, which is the good guy, attempts to introduce uh, traffic calming measures. And there's a red guy, uh, it's, it's playing um, and, and tries to disrupt the system and they train against each other. Okay, this is slightly contrived uh, kind of case. And you can see it's a kind of figure of eight. This is done to, to, <coughs> to, real, to make our life, life easy, essentially, to get rid of all sorts of boundary conditions. And I've got a few other cases where things don't go to plan, meaning that the, 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 um, the red wins. Again, it's actually in this case, again, it's a kind of contrived uh, 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 setup where it's not that difficult for the red guy to come up with policies that will in, introduce havoc. But again, the, what we wanted to show is that applicability of kind of deep RL self-play and adversarial self-play to this type of cybersecurity setup where you, can, you, know, you don't have to manually think about um, the attack surface. A few more slides just to kind of wrap up and show you a few examples of Bristol is highly measured city. We've done, as a part of our uh, project, we've done lots of kind of driving around with, you know, in our test cars with lots of stuff on the roof, measured the whole lot. We, 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 we built our own system from scratch, literally, so DSRC uh, system built from scratch. And we measured various quantities just to understand better how the system would, would work in a kind of city like Bristol. We did weird things, uh, also transmitting at different frequencies. You know, DSR DSRC uh, is supposed uh, to work at six uh, gigs, but we tried uh, with um, in ISM bands. And in fact, you could potentially share this band. So that was the, 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 the result of that study. Um, but we also measured the distance. Uh, this is kind of one uh, literally headline uh, figure. So this is something that we define a uh, collaborative awareness horizon. Effectively, this is, uh, you can think of it as um, a success probability, it's a packet delivery rate, you can think of this uh, as, a, as the function of, 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 of distance. When you buy or when you read um, the tech spec of commercial available devices, they will tell you it's a thousand meters uh, and there's no way you can have it in, in an urban environment, much less than that. I should say this is uh, blasting pretty high up. Oh, you know, it's our device. We, we, we could blast, well, not as much as we want, but pretty high up. It doesn't really help that much. That's another kind of very, uh, I think that's probably final use case. Um, we, we have not just our devices scattered around Bristol city center, but also our, our fog units uh, collocated with RSUs that do lots of uh, compute, collect statistics. And one, one kind of use case we, we've done is, uh, we looked at CRL, it is a certificate revocation list, that would stand for. This is a means of providing effectively trust um, to, to, to vehicles. These vehicles work on blacklists rather than whitelists uh, because you, know, you hope that the number of misbehaving vehicles is a small proportion of the total fleet. So it makes more sense to have a blacklist rather than a whitelist and you just uh, disseminate uh, the blacklist. <laughs> can do it two ways. Okay, there's many ways of do this. Here, what we've done, we've encoded that using uh, uh, fountain codes. And you can improve, you can basically disseminate more efficiently and faster. We call it improved security horizon because you, know, you can provide uh, the, this trust uh, in other vehicles to each vehicle much faster. Right, I've got the last slide because uh, typically I've done similar talk a few times and there's always a question. So what's gonna happen? When are we gonna have all of that? And there's lots of, um, uh, popular press out there, so I've uh, just to preempt this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this questions. Uh, I've got kind of crystal ball, and I'm gonna make some some brave predictions. So, are we there yet? Uh, no, we're not there yet, obviously, um, but we will be soon. Uh, so currently, we have Tesla out there already that that is level three, um, and it depends. We'll, it, we'll have it better. These things will improve, but I don't think it's gonna, a uh, level five, it's gonna arrive in the next five years. I don't think that this is going to happen. Instead, so in terms of uh, connectivity, uh, we're gonna have sort of enhanced awareness comes then 
I'm gonna skip the electrification and shared aspects. We, we don't have the time and I didn't really cover that anyway. Um, so the next stage is next uh, five to 10 years, we should have a level, a level four uh, on our roads. Could be we'll have level five, uh, um, but you know, who, who knows really. And I think we should also see some attempts um, to, to introduce uh, um, some elements of uh, traffic flow or orchestration, so the direction of traffic flows. And, uh, and um, last stage, um, so I think level five will arrive inevitably. This is just too much happening, but it's going to take much longer. Um, okay, now I'll be brave. I'll say it's not going to happen. Full level five is not going to happen in, in the next uh, uh, 10 years. Um, so 10 to 30 years, full level five. Uh, the problem is, is, is very, very tough. And, um, what is also tough is uh, collaborative um, awareness and sensing. So, okay, I, 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 maybe the, the, what I have said so far seemed like this is easy. This is not actually easy. This, this, this is very tough uh, problem, and there's a number of reasons why the problem is tough, uh, collaborative awareness. The, the kind of baseline is easy. So basically, that's what my current trip parameters are. But taking it to another level, so full kind of driving intention sharing is really tough. I've, that, that's old. Um, I've, I've, we, we've produced a number of papers. I've, 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 I think um, I'll happily share the slides after. So if, if you're interested, there is, yeah, I can point you to, to, to a particular paper. But we've produced a number of papers that are out there in the public domain. And then they... they, they um, uh, unpack uh, much more than I, uh, what I had time to discuss today. And that's it. That is my last slide. So thank you. Uh, I hope you're still alert. And yes, I will be very happy to answer any questions. I should say that obviously this is the work with uh, um, that, that um, number, large number of people contributed to that work. Uh, these names uh, appeared in, in the publications. And you're, there's an ex uh, Thessaloniki man who has done tremendous work. He's still in Bristol. So yes, uh, it was absolutely great and pleasure working with Yanis and everybody else. So thanks a lot again. And yes, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, take uh, any questions you may have.